I oh, just yes. noticed. Okay, very good. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for having joined our uh, round table today. Um, we start today with this round table. Uh, our public, the first public event of our project uh, on transnational political contention in Europe, tra poco, um, as the acronym sound in Italian uh, soon uh, is uh, the meaning. Um, so um, we immediately start with um, uh, giving the floor to the director of uh, the Scuola Normale Superiore, who is the leading partner of our consortium. Um, uh, just to remind you, one sentence about this consortium is um, a Jean Monnet Action uh, Erasmus Plus program supported by the European Commission. And we're going to work for three years together um, on the topic of um, political contention in Europe with the idea to explore how movements, social movements, non governmental organizations, and activists and trade unions uh, work. Uh, Centering the space for rights and democracy in Europe. So the floor is yours, Professor um, uh, Luigi D'Ambrosio, Director of the Scuola Normale Superiore. Thank you. Thank you very much. So welcome all. I am happy to introduce uh, the first working seminar of the Translational Political Contention in Europe project, uh, abbreviated to TRAPOCO. As you know, and also as uh, already Luis Chiodi mentioned, this project will be devoted to the study of translational political activism within the European space. And the Normale, the Scuola Normale, will be the coordinator of the consortium, which, which is, I think, already a quite intensive program of initiatives within the next uh, three years. Uh, this collaboration involves many universities and also um, extra academic organizations, which I think are all represented here today. And uh, this collaboration is part of the research on international political and social movements that the class of political and social sciences of uh, the Scuola Normale is carrying out as its privileged area of research. As you know, uh, this academic structure of the Scuola Normale is relatively recent but is already obtaining flattering results. And this is testified, for instance, by the considerable presence of young researchers in, uh, from, all, from all over the world uh, in, in Florence. Also, the Scuola Normale has a long tradition among its professors and students or scholars which, uh, who have distinguished themselves by contributing to a broad reflection on Europe such as uh, the current emeritus professor uh, uh, Sabino Cassese, uh, Salvatore Settis, a former director of the school, uh, by the way. And in the past, in the more uh, um, recent past, the figures as uh, Eugenio Garen and Elio Cantimori. And not to mention, of course, uh, President Ciampi, uh, whose contribution or gave an important contribution to the creation of the European political and social space. And uh, for all these reasons, I am happy to, to see that this tradition somehow is continuing in the best possible way. And I wish uh, to your seminar, but also to the whole project, uh, the best, uh, my best wishes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we should have been all together in, in Florence, uh, um, but we will certainly have new occasions uh, um, to be and visit your Scuola Normale Florence uh, um, uh, in, in the next um, period of work. Um, Thank you for hosting us. And um, we right away go to uh, introducing the the research um, uh, uh, we are going to conduct uh, in the next few years with um, uh, an introductory uh, remark uh, by Donatella Della Porta, who is professor at uh, political science and dean of the faculty of political and social science of the Scuola Normale Superiore. Thank you, Donatella, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Luisa, and thank you, Luigi, uh, for uh, this uh, uh, introduction. I want to say just a few words about the project the structure uh, for those who are joining us uh, from outside of uh, our institutions. The Trapoco project is a Jean Monnet network that has a special uh, structure. So it's very welcome for us because uh, it goes a bit beyond the traditional uh, um, uh, res just uh, research academic project, uh, having three sort of pillars. Uh, one is uh, research and scientific networking, but the other one are teaching and training, and uh, the third one, the dialogue with civil society and policy makers. And this, I think, is particularly important on a topic like transnationalizations of social movements, which has uh, a, a strong potential, both in terms of uh, a teaching and in terms of uh, um, an important dialogue that we want to establish. The uh, network is also characterized by the presence of um, young researchers and more senior ones. Uh, coming from uh, different institutions in different countries, but all of them also with uh, international background. So uh, I wish to welcome uh, the participations of uh, uh, University uh, uh, College Dublin, uh, of the University of Belgrade, uh, of Buco uh, in uh, Vienna, uh, and also uh, as our uh, um, academic partners, but also uh, to welcome the participations of two civil society organizations, uh, like the one that assumed a, a directing role uh, in the presentations of this uh, project, the Osservatorio sui Balcani uh, e il Caucaso, which Luisa Chiodi is part, and the Good Lobby. And uh, uh, I uh, wish all of us a good uh, work on this. Uh, beyond the structures that attract us to apply uh, for this uh, Jamon and network, it is also uh, very relevant uh, uh, for Cosmos at the School of Normale Superior and the Faculty of Science. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Is there someone is, uh, uh, okay, uh, is the topic because uh, transnationalizations and social movements is a central uh, topic for the development of two elements that are um, missing uh, or weak at the moment in the process of European uh, uh, integrations. One is accountability. And it has been observed often that uh, a special type of institutions like the European Union needs a different channels of uh, uh, accountability. And social movements and civil society have provided some of these important channels. So the challenge is how to connect better uh, channels of accountability with channels of uh, uh, institutions of governance. The second type of role that the civil society has in Europe uh, is the development of a European demos. So is the development of uh, an uh, European identity that, as we know, is difficult to build top down within institutions that have a strong uh, intergovernmental type of uh, uh, format. And uh, social movements often, especially social movements of the progressive type, by the uh, uh, forms of contestation, they have also built up uh, ties among each other and uh, uh, ideas about alternative Europe's proposals for policy makers. In, uh, uh, in a few words, they have constructed or um, are constructing that type of uh, uh, European identities that uh, is one of the main uh, challenge uh, and resource for the development of a European uh, uh, um, uh, political system. Uh, the importance of social movements for uh, uh, the uh, constructions of an alternative union 
uh, and alternative Europe uh, has been recognized, uh, has been researched upon, but what I think is the important um, aspects uh, and contributions that our networks can give is to observe how uh, processes of Europeanization of social movements have changed in time and especially how they have changed in our uh, times, that are times of uh, Gramscian organic crisis uh, or uh, uh, critical junctures uh, in which um, several challenges uh, are arising uh, in uh, uh, terms of multi-level governance, but also in terms of the civil societies. What we have seen in uh, the research on the civil society in Europe have been uh, uh, the uh, development of these processes uh, at uh, different stages in different forms in different moments and not in a linear forms. So we have seen uh, that um, starting uh, in the 80s, the 90s, uh, the uh, development of a Europeanization process has been driven especially by uh, the more structured civil society organizations that have been active uh, like good lobby Brussels, but what we have seen uh, also is that uh, uh, a moment of strong reflections uh, on uh, European alternatives uh, has come later on, in part formed uh, through these uh, 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 civil society organizations, but in part also um, developing uh, uh, through uh, massive forms of protest like the counter summits, but also um, very developed type of uh, uh, coordinations like the uh, European social forums in which smaller and bigger, horizontal and more vertical type of civil society organizations and social movements have uh, uh, converged. Uh, we thought at this point that the process of Europeanization of uh, civil society was a sort of trend towards more and more participations of civil society in the European process, but we, uh, we were to a certain extent surprised when uh, the uh, uh, economic crisis, financial crisis and austerity protest have uh, meant a return to a certain extent to the national level. So it was no longer an expectation of uh, a sort of uh, trend, a coherent trend towards more Europeanization through the development of transnational structures. But what we saw was uh, more complex forms. Uh, in the research we have done uh, in more recent years, what we have seen is that Europe is still very central, uh, but at the same time also that uh, the process of the European Social Forums and the coordinations at the um, supranational level has been weakened during the, the uh, financial crisis uh, by lack of resources, but also by diminishing opportunities. And so that uh, the forms that transnationalizations and Europeanizations has taken is a more uh, horizontal forms, uh, in some cases fragmented on different type of issues, uh, in some uh, cases um, uh, informal, but uh, building up uh, some sort of more continuous type of uh, uh, interactions. And uh, this uh, I think it is important to look at these uh, different forms, different processes of scaling up of uh, uh, type of conflicts, but also on the other end of interactions between uh, uh, local, national and uh, uh, transnational uh, level. So what we are seeing at the moment is uh, not the interruption of the of Europeanization of social movements, but a mutation of the forms. And what we are going to look at in, uh, with our research is also the uh, ways in which yet another crisis, like the pandemic crisis, uh, has affected these 
process by uh, producing uh, uh, urgency for actions, but at the same time, uh, urgency to focus on uh, uh, cha very challenging um, uh, issues uh, uh, and under very strained circumstances. So I think our project is timely in addressing uh, uh, this uh, mutation of the uh, Europeanization um, of process uh, in uh, social movements and civil societies. That at the same time also uh, is timely uh, because we tend to observe uh, uh, transformations also at the level of the European Union. Some talk of uh, a learning process uh, of European Union institutions that are addressing this crisis uh, with instruments that are different uh, and policies that are di different from the ones that have been used to address the financial uh, uh, crisis. But also we see new conflicts emerging between European member states. Uh, so we see new opportunities, but also uh, uh, new constraints and a uh, new way, a way in which Europe uh, uh, becomes relevant for uh, the uh, citizens and the civil society uh, um, organizations that we are going to investigate. Uh, last words, we are going to investigate, especially for uh, a type of uh, civil society organizations uh, focusing on labor, migration, environment, and uh, uh, civic rights and gender issues. Uh, and uh, on all of these, we are going to uh, understand the role that uh, civil societies is playing and can play uh, within this type of uh, crisis that is uh, uh, a crisis that is uh, uh, challenging our uh, political and social system, but it is also a challenge, first research says, uh, that is increasing sentiments of solidarity uh, that are spreading uh, uh, in the populations. And so our research is also important in the contributions it can give uh, to an uh, solutions to crisis uh, that enhance the sense of uh, solidarity and that help addressing uh, challenges at the level of uh, uh, labor, migration, environment and gender rights that I think are fundamental. So I wish to thank uh, all our partners and I wish to thank also uh, the colleagues that are joining us uh, uh, from other uh, institutions that are also uh, leading uh, research in this field, and I give the floor back to Luisa for the continuation of this encounter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donatella, for this very effective um, panoramic of um, what we are going to discuss and the relevance of our um, project. Um, indeed, we want to stimulate the growth of an inter interdisciplinary community um, around this project. So it is very important that um, um, here we are already 39 participants to the, um, to the meeting and hopefully in, over time we will be able to tighten relations between uh, among us and with many more colleagues um, uh, at European and, and uh, extra European level. And this is why we decided to start our discussion panel on transnational Europe dynamics and opportunities uh, by inviting two um, uh, scholars that are not officially member of the project team, but uh, that we hope will continue working with us. So uh, first of all, um, the, um, I introduce you to um, Pierre Montfort. Monforte, um, Associate Professor at University of Leicester, um, who is the first of our panelists. Pierre, the floor to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you, Luisa. Thank you for, for the invitation. Um, it's great to hear about this new, new network, which is um, definitely relevant and topical. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry that I will have to leave a bit earlier at uh, 2.30 here in the UK, so 3.30 for, for you in, uh, in mainland Europe. Uh, 
um, um, so what, what uh, uh, I have 15 minutes, is, is that right? OK, so what I thought I would do, I prepared some, um, it's not really a, a presentation, it's more kind of a reflection on uh, questions related to Europeanization and how to uh, how to analyze, how to observe Europeanization. Um, uh, so, the, the, so it's not really structure, it's more kind of a reflection in progress. I hope you, you bear with me um, on that. Um, I would look at the case of uh, the, the movements for the rights of migrants and refugees in recent years, so the, the so-called uh, refugees welcome movement. Uh, this is a movement on which I've been working in the last uh, three to four years. And the question is, uh, the question I would like to uh, reflect upon, think about with you is uh, what is European about the refugees welcome movement? Uh, so, so this question is based on the ERCRC project, uh, UK based project on which I've been working recently. Uh, and what we did in this project is not really about the Europeanization or transnationalization of movements. Uh, we analyze the motivations and experience of volunteers who uh, participants uh, in the movements of solidarity that emerged in the context of the um, refugee crisis in 2015. Uh, this movement, of course, emerged across Europe. And we focused on uh, the cases of uh, two countries in particular, France and the UK, uh, but we also did some field work in, in Italy. Uh, so we interviewed around 150 what we call ordinary participants uh, who dedicate to different types of actions within these movements. Uh, so people who host refugees, uh, people who provide legal advice, uh, people who make donations in Calais, who go regularly to Calais, people who offer, who offer language courses to refugees and so on. And I say, I insist on this, these are uh, what we call ordinary participants, because we didn't, um, uh, this was the purpose of the project, we didn't focus on uh, leaders of the movements, uh, we didn't interview organizational representatives uh, or activists which are involved in social movement strategies. Uh, we focused more on people who dedicate their time to the, to the movement, to the refugees welcome movement, uh, but who are not really at the forefront of the organizations and the networks that compose it. So I mentioned this because I think this will be important for the reflection on how to um, analyze Europeanization in this type of movement, and I will, I will come back to this. Um, so, so this movement has been studied by uh, many scholars, some, some are here uh, today with us. Uh, Donatella in particular and others, um, uh, and the studies so far have focused on the question of its, uh, the emergence of the movement, uh, how do we explain the massive wave of solidarity uh, and compassion towards refugees in 2015. Uh, studies have looked at the forms of actions, also original forms of action, so a mix of activism, protest and uh, humanitarian, more charity type of action. And also more recently, studies have looked at the, the repression that the movement has faced. So far, uh, few studies have dealt, I think, with the transnational, the European uh, nature of the movement. So I would like to share my reflection about this aspect in particular, because I think this, um, this question can raise some interesting perspectives on uh, how to think about transnationalization of social movements uh, in general, beyond the case of this uh, refugees welcome movement. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the question is, what is European about the refugees welcome movement? And I think the more general question is, um, how do we observe uh, the European, how do we analyze the European dimension of social movements uh, from a very practical perspective? Uh, I think this question is both a matter of approach. What do we look at when we want to analyze Europeanization, transnationalization processes? And it's also a matter of methods. What are the instruments that we use to um, observe, to maybe measure Europeanization of social movements? Um, so here, very quickly, uh, 
looking at the literature on Europeanization and transnationalization, uh, and I have contributed uh, modestly myself to, to this literature and previous research about 10 years ago. Um, uh, if we, so if we look at this literature, I would argue that it's very much inspired by um, approaches related to political processes, broadly speaking, and by a focus on organizational strategies, uh, often looking at uh, specific movement campaigns. So studies have analyzed different modes of Europeanization, uh, so uh, domestication, externalization, transnationalization, for example. Um, they have looked generally at how social movements organizations position themselves in relation to institutional targets, so European institutions, member states, or both. And, and this, uh, in, in much of the literature, I think, is uh, really much in line with an approach focused on movement strategies. What are the strategies in terms of targeting the European or national spheres? And from a methodological point of view, uh, studies have looked at different indicators to, uh, to observe and sometimes to measure the Europeanization of social movements, uh, looking at, uh, in particular, on the scope of collective actions, what levels are they organized, uh, looking at the networks, whether they have cross-national connections or not, and looking at the, also the, the frames, whether the, the, the discourses of movements have a European dimension or not. Um, so I, I think these approaches and instruments are very useful if we want to analyze uh, organizations, if we want to analyze campaigns, uh, and how the Europeanization of public policies impact the strategies of movements. And this is something I've done myself in my previous research, I, and I show that uh, movements for migrants' rights in the 1990s and 2000s have uh, distinct modes of Europeanization, uh, depending on how they are traditionally positioned in their national field. <clears throat> um, however, the, the question is, um, uh, I think today, can this type of approach be applied to analyze uh, the European dimension of movements like the refugees welcome movement. And my feeling is that uh, here th there are maybe some uh, limitations uh, if we apply it to this type of, of cases. And for two reasons in particular. The first one is that if we look at this movement, uh, we have to move the focus, I think, from organizations and campaigns to individuals, individual participants. And this is what, why I insisted earlier on this notion of ordinary participants. Uh, Refugees Welcome is a movement that emerged out of local networks and initiatives of individuals, uh, often very disconnected from organizations that had been pre present in the field uh, for decades. Of course, organizations have been active, they have structured some part of the movement, and they have organized campaigns. But if we focus only on organizations uh, and, and the campaigns they have organized, we miss I think, one of the original features of the movements, which is the fact that it's emerged out of uh, individual engagement and initiatives to very informal networking processes. Um, the, the, the second reason I think why th this type of approaches might be um, uh, limited to, to analyze the Euro uh, European dimension of this type of movement, and I think this is probably the most important reason, uh, is that the forms of engagement in the refugees welcome movements uh, have been largely, um, what we say, depoliticized. Uh, in the sense that participants don't address political institutions directly and they don't necessarily claim directly uh, for broad political and social change. Uh, so if we look at our interviews, one of the uh, uh, 
presentation of the, the participants' engagement that comes very often in almost all the interviews that we did is that you know th we are not here to do politics. We're not interested in politics. We're not here to change the system. Uh, we are here to uh, help the people that we want to uh, support in a very concrete way. So it's not about broad political and social changes. We don't address, we don't aim to address institutions, whether they are European or national. Uh, so, so for this reason, I, I believe the focus on organizational strategies and modes of Europeanization and institutional targets doesn't really allow us to capture the European dimension of this movement. Uh, of, yes, in our field work, participants refer to in the interviews, participants refer to European institutions and they blame European institutions for uh, the situation of refugees. Uh, but, but institutions, European institutions are only mentioned as some kind of distant actors uh, and, and um, our participants don't really target institutions. Uh, also, most of them don't have uh, networks beyond national borders. Yes, yet we claim that uh, these people, these ordinary participants, these, uh, uh, who uh, dedicate their time to uh, help refugees, they are part of a European movement. Uh, and we observe many similarities, many common references in the narratives and the practices of participants in Britain, in France, in Italy. Um, so they make references to uh, symbolic places and events that have a European dimension. Uh, so it's uh, Lampedusa, uh, uh, the situation in Calais. They can mention the, the picture of Alan Kurdi. All these their references uh, mean uh, for them have a European meaning, if you want. It's not about uh, Britain. It's not about France specifically. It's about a European situation. Uh, they also refer make references uh, to common practices, uh, practices of hospitality, practices of compassion, practices of solidarity, uh, in very similar terms, uh, whether we are in Britain, in France or in Italy. So there is, although they don't target European institutions, there is something very European here in the way they present their engagement. There are uh, strong commonalities across borders. Um, so, so I think that this example is, to me, is interesting at a general level because <clears throat> it, I think it, it leads us to, to think about the way we analyze what is European about social movements, what is transnational about social movements. Uh, and my feeling is that if we want to analyze the European dimension of this movement and any movement really, uh, I believe we need to, th to try to think about Europeanization beyond political processes, uh, beyond uh, organizational strategies, beyond uh, uh, movements campaigns. And I think we need to engage more directly with the uh, culture, what is probably the cultural dimension of Europeanization. Refugees welcome is European, uh, not because it targets European institution or is or because it is based on European networks and frames. Uh, I think it is European at a more general level because it is based on a rejection, a challenge of dominant cultural interpretations, which can be found across all European societies. In this case, we have a rejection, a common challenge uh, across bound, uh, borders, across national borders. Uh, so a common challenge of exclusionary immigration politics and discourses that we find across Europe. Um, so um, uh, allow me to come back to um, the classic, classical definition of Europeanization by uh, Claudio uh, Radaeli. Uh, Europeanization is a shared beliefs and norms that are defined in the EU policy processes and then incorporated into domestic politics. Uh, my, my point here, what I'm trying to advocate is to focus not only on the policy processes in this definition, but also more specifically on the shared beliefs and norms. 
So what is European about these shared beliefs and norms? And what is European about the alternative beliefs and norms put forward by social movements? I think this is uh, what um, Donatella mentioned earlier with uh, this idea of uh, European alternative, European identity uh, put forward by social movements. And from the perspective, I think my proposal is that we could define and analyze the European dimension of social movements through the cultural and also through the prefigurative practices of social movements participants. Uh, so at the very micro level, the level of uh, participant engagements, uh, and this will be in addition to the organizational uh, level at the moment. And we could define this European dimension as being uh, really much in the construction of alternative political subjectivities that are by definition transnational, uh, because they are alternative to dominant cultural framework, which are common to uh, different European uh, country societies. And we could even go further, I think, uh, through the focus on culture and prefigurative politics, and maybe argue that the European dimension of a movement can be found in its internal practice, in its doing rather than its strategies of claim making. Uh, in other words, I think we could argue that a movement such as refugees welcome movement uh, is European because it is based on common referentials and because in its practice uh, it represents a rupture of the dominant European uh, cultural uh, um, order or imagination. Um, so I, I don't really have a conclusion to this um, uh, again, uh, reflections rather than a uh, clear presentation. Um, um, and I was reading my notes, so I couldn't really see your uh, reactions to that. Um, uh, um, but yeah, I hope um, we, could lead to a discussion. Have, thank, you. thank you very much. Yeah, you will have the chance to end our discussion uh, panel to ask you specific questions. Thank you very much. Very much. As we have had someone should switch off the um, the microphone and leave only mine, unfortunately. Thank you. Sorry, otherwise it was an echo. Um, thank you so much. And now, as we have really little time um, and plenty of very important um, uh, um, speeches to, to listen to, um, I want to give the floor immediately to Sabrina um, Zayak um, of the Deutsche Zentrum für Integrations- und Migrationsforschung and professor at the Faculty of Social Science at, uh, um, Science at the Ruhr University Bochum, who is join, who joined us um, as a second non-partner, um, providing us uh, with external ideas to our um, network Trapoco. Thank you, Sabine. Can you switch on your microphone, Sabine? Sabine. We can now see your presentation, but your microphone is still um, off. So it is only you who can turn it on. If you move. Uh, okay, now finally. Okay, I have to do it again. Ca camera activated. Sorry. Okay, one more time. Oh. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you very, very much for this invitation. And I'm uh, um, happy to, uh, uh, to to join this debate today. And uh, I think it very well fits to what Donatella said at the beginning uh, of the introduction and um, the presentation before on what Europeanization means actually. Is it really about tactics, strategies, um, towards European institutions, is it European playmaking, or is it rather practices? Although I come to a little bit different conclusion, 
And what I do is also a little bit, I thought about um, not presenting one research project, but um, insights uh, I had from different kinds of research I did in my past and I'm doing in my present, which is also concerning about transnational activism in a little bit broader terms, not only in Europe, but also um, beyond covering uh, transnational activism across the North-South divide. Um, let me see if this works. And so this is why I put down different affiliations of mine where I cross different things. So let me start building on the shoulders of giants. There are a lot of really good books out there and contributions. Some of the network members, uh, your network members contributed to and which are basically uh, the ground of, of readings in this field of transnational activism. Uh, from Kick and Ticking, I only put the picture below, um, which is about uh, the boomerang patterns. We had transnational advocacy networks and the boomerang patterns, one of the most quoted books on, on transnational activism, which bridged social movement research with international relations, the works of Sid Terro and Donatella della Porta on scale shifts, um, meaning um, uh, the, the bottom-up scale shifts or the top-down scale shift, the addressing of other European actors in the sphere. Uh, the diffusion of practices across borders or the diffusion and translation of things. But we also have questions of actually what makes a movement a European movement versus a global movement. And I think this is a question uh, this network also has to, to think about because some of the practices, but also the strategies, you could embed that in also, you can also see it in, in countries across the globe. So there's always this hard uh, question and difficult question to answer what is actually Europe, European about movements such as the pro-migrant movement, the global, uh, the climate movement uh, or the labor movement. Let me go through some of the things I was thinking about in the past on how to conceptualize transnational activism, which could also be of relevance for uh, studying social movements in Europe. And when one thing, I think one aspect is interesting is the literature and theorizing of transnational institutional theories. Um, and we had this in the beginning, Europe is a complex set up with different institutions. Um, these are regime complexes, but somehow when you talk about global governance, it seems relatively well structured and the focus is on international or supranational institutions, leaving aside the huge amount of transnational governance institutions and their interactions, which also not only include supranational organizations, international ones, but a lot of uh, private ones, multi-stakeholder initiatives and so forth. And they just came into the awareness of social movement studies once in a while. For example, when we had the financial crisis, I think um, suddenly things like Basel I and Basel II, so meaning private banking regulations and financialization came up in the awareness of, of social movement studies. And I think uh, um, this is an aspect um, which could also be looked into following some of the my favorites and in institutional scholars, Pearson and Scotchpool, which actually said a long time ago, it makes sense to hypothesize about combined effects of institutions and processes rather than examining just one institutional process at a time. Or Bernstein and Koshori, who tried to transfer this to the international area and looked at, okay, how are countries connected through global markets, international rules, international norms, domestic infiltration of transnational actors. And this can be movement contexts on how they operate across borders. So basically, transnational activism is being embedded in plural context of, of of layers of, of institutions which actually by themselves interact and influence each other. Uh, they evolve huh? and they have different types of compliance mechanisms. So they are rather as such very complex uh, phenomena which interact with the domestic context and transnational activism is in between. Um, and they are coordinating, they are working along uh, different paths of influence and they are operating different, according to different logics. And um, I think this is a part where we can also open up new questions and work on the intersection of uh, what Kiyohane called regime complexes, meaning 
For example, how does the global migration, labor, governance, global climate regime structure social movement activities across uh, across borders? And uh, Donatella mentioned at the beginning, there are multiple uh, social movements at play here in Europe at the moment. And I think it could be worth uh, exploring really and leave their links uh, to the different regime complexes and how they operate across those uh, regimes. Yeah? So this is basically making a point or trying to make a point for uh, uh, taking into account recent institutional theories about regime complexes and their interactions with social movements. Um, another, uh, another aspect I think which which is at least very important to me is the shape and current situation of global capitalism. There's a long debate on bringing capitalism back in, in social movement studies. And the question is which type of capitalism we are living in. And um, well, uh, different framings, but I think that the idea of a global cultural capitalism is a really is a really good one because it stresses that um, the commodification we see right now, the, the, the extension of the market logic in different areas is not only the integration in the life and the, or the people and the land and the money, as for example, Polanyi or Marx or other authors framed it for a long time, but currently we see a very strong commodification of our creative potential. Yeah? So it's about culture, it's about lifestyles, yeah? it's about critique and authenticity. Yeah? And the, the thing about capitalism is that it is very strong and very fast in eating up its critics. I really like the formulation and I love French social, sociologists. Anyhow, from Boltanski and Chapiello and also the latest work from Boltanski and, and um, Iskia on these issues. And this is important because, as we heard before, a lot of things in Europe is about practices and social practices, which is also about creativity, uh, which is about innovation, which is about prefiguration. And then I think it's also important to think about or at least acknowledge the ways the capital, the system, the current capitalist system is turning uh, this newly constructed values, the liberal values into liberal, into neoliberal forms. And one example, <clears throat> Okay, why is it? No, I can't. No, it's frozen. Where the question comes up is, uh, for example, in the Fridays for Future protest, where you see both types of strategizing. I call first the contentious multi level strategizing, which is targeting actors at the city, the state, the re regional, the European but level, but also at the global level. But there's a lot of cultural strategizing going on, the prefiguring of lifestyles and the performativity of future practices. Um, and come on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I leave this out, which brings a couple of open questions, at least into my mind, how can counter movements organize if capitalism has this huge capacity and high speed to absorb what we call counter? Huh? And how can movements contribute to and prefigure the social embeddedness of markets in Europe? And after all, Europe is a lot about market making. Um, and I think we should look into how movements are also market shaping. Huh? And how is this possible under the conditions of current cultural capitalism? I think we see kind of a new double movement in this regard. So on the one hand, strong forces of economization of the cultural social, but also um, the mobilization and reinvention of cultural social practices which then try to exert their influence not through direct targeting but through the diffusion across countries and slow trickle up effects yeah, as enactments of future visions but there is not only the challenge of capitalism as, as such absorbing those strategies or practices and turning them into market value there's also the challenge of the counter movement to the counter movement and the resistance against all forms of lifestyle politics in particular from the right wing. We see that very strongly in, in, in German mobilization, but I think you can see that also across U Europe. And now during the crisis, um, the counter alliances of the corona or, or hygiene, as we call it, hygiene protests um, uh, in, in, in Germany, which try to, uh, which have the strong link with um, conspiracy theorists um, countering also other forms of protest of the left and progressive side. Okay, 
Uh, coming to basically uh, uh, the the third point, I think, which is uh, important, and I don't know why I cut. Okay, um, this was looking from the outside, and now I turn more to the inside of Europeanization within social movements and cross movement alliances in fields of contention. Because I think when we thought, think about Europeanization, we could look at two different. There are two different challenges for building networks, yeah, not only the diffusion of practices through weak links, but establishing networks. Uh, you don't, you not only have to cross borders, but you have to cross organizational logics. Yeah? And these organizations or initiatives or even individuals, they are embedded um, in the different country contracts, in the different localities, in different institutional settings and so they have different resources organizational individual histories identities world worlds, ideological positions and skills and actually when you think about all these challenges and different logics they have it's actually always a miracle that movements are so capable of building these transnational networks and i think um where we could get a little bit further in terms of research, and I don't need to get into this, is uh, looking into boundary spanning practices, not only looking into direct contacts or networks or framing, but really about uh, how boundaries are redefined, starting with social categorizations and the construction of others. Yeah? So social movements are not only good at interpreting what is Europeanization, what do we think about democracy and framing social problems and categorizing problems or situations or political actors, but they are also perceiving and categorizing themselves. Yeah? And by that, I mean each individual organization. Huh? They, they draw boundaries and bridge boundaries as conceptual distinctions made by social actors to categorize objects, people, practices even times and spaces, um, when I follow Michel Lamont's um, definition on that. Um, and there's also other very interesting work from Sarah Soule in the US, Christina Fleischer from Minaya, and so forth on, on boundary spanning work, how activists deal with ideological differences, but also the cultural images of the other, yeah? Um, because it helps to reflect on existing forms of discrimination, exclusion, uh, and marginalization within alliance structures. Huh? So always the challenging topics, we try to talk about movements or networks as a whole, and we avoid, we tend to avoid to look into the details of, of, of internal politics across spaces. Huh? And by looking into the activities, it could be worth to go more into details on how groups are actually categorizing each other yeah? and how they interpret positionalities within movements and the intersection of inequalities yeah? and the kind of empowerment strategies resulting out of it. Um, I, and I think this becomes more important and relevant now in times of a corona crisis because it makes the inequalities more visible as it lays additional layers of marginalization on top of existing ones. Yeah? So the already marginalized are effect, affected much stronger than, than others and movements start to uh, make it more visible and think about intersectionality and different positionality and also different barriers, for example, for participating within a movement. Yeah? I'm not only talking about the digital divide, but also the ability to join physical protest, for example, for of, due to restraints, let's say refugees uh, in their refugees camps and so forth. So, so there, there are a lot of more restraints and new thinking about intersectionalities. Yeah, basically, uh, that's it. I hope this was somehow uh, um, helpful. I don't know. So when I think about Europeanization and contention in Europe, I think it unfolds in transnational fields with complex actor constellations from the local to the supranational, including states, non-states, business and uh, multinational companies. Yeah? So we have this, on the one hand, this targeting and this complex strategizing, um, but we have also... Uh, the, the structuring of movements across borders, so Europeanization is looking inside of movements because it can tell us a lot about what Europeanization actually means, and we are not only finding the construction of demos, but we are also finding a lot of power relations within the fields. Um, 
Genau. And I think the three uh, uh, um, things which characterizes uh, European movements is this complex targeting, this alliance formation processes, and the prefiguration of politics and socio-cultural changes to future practices. Um, yeah, and the crisis in this regard, and now I mean the, the pandemic crisis, has two challenges in this regard through the relocalization, yeah, making it on one hand more difficult to build transnational networks, but on the other hand, it also makes it easier, for example, through certain things of digitalization. And this is why I think we see a kind of reconfiguration of this transnational movement landscape in Europe during pandemic crisis. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so, sorry. Um, thank you, Sabrina. We will get back to you at the end of the presentations. Um, thank you for drawing so many different aspects to take into account in our future development. Um, it is time now to give the floor to the four members of the research teams. Um, so, which one, I think I was too generous in considering 15 minutes each, so if you can uh, be slightly shorter, we'll have more time for uh, questions at the very end. So, Elisaveta Petrovic, Research Fellow at the University of Belgrade, the first uh, to give a, a speech. Her work is around environmental activism and the EU enlargement lessons from Serbia. The floor is yours. Hello to everyone, and uh, I'm very happy to be, part be to participate in this project and to participate in this uh, online conference, I would say. And hopefully uh, next time there will be more people from Serbia because we have a lot of uh, scholars who are interested in, in this topic and the PhD students as well. So I will be say I will introduce give some introduction actually to development of environmental activism in Serbia in context of the Europeanization and the development of transnational movements. And at the beginning, I will start from the from the end or, or start backwards, because I will mention a few a few events that occurred recently in Serbia and that they are related to the environmental activism. First, uh, I would mention the, the uh, happenings in July this year when Belgrade residents protested against the cutting of the trees of the big uh, park area called Košutnjak in Belgrade and they forced entry to construction site and stopped actually this, uh, this cutting of the trees. Similar uh, event occurred in the August this year. Also, people both from eastern, southwest part of Serbia and from Belgrade and other parts of Serbia came to Rakita, which is place where um, small hydropower plants are being uh, constructed against the law, and they actually for, stopped this uh, this um, uh, uh, this. Um, hydropower plants from uh, operating and they even dismantled the mantle pipes that were put in the local river bands and stopped the, this, this initiative and there was initiative to build uh, 850, uh, 850 power plants, small power plants in Serbia and the initiative actually stopped at least for the moment, this this from uh, continuing. Also, several months ago, people in Bor, which is a small town in eastern Serbia, protested against excessive air pollution due to the Chinese factories aging copper. And also we have many protests against air pollution last winter because Belgrade was at the top of the list of the most polluted cities in the world. And uh, I'm mentioning all of these recent events because when I started researching environmental activism 10 years ago, this wasn't the case. Actually, environment wasn't at all uh, something that ordinary citizens in Serbia were thinking about, only if something really local happened and then they had to protest or to stop some kind of pollution or some other event. But this is changing and I would, uh, this is good that it's changing because Serbia as, as many other countries in the region is facing serious 
environmental issues, some of them related to climate change, some of them related to air, water and soil pollution. So we have plenty of, of environmental problems. But what is interesting is this environmental activism and uh, environmental recent environmental protests are mostly relate they're bottom up and they're mostly related to the recent um, protests against the the regime of uh, Alexander Vucic so they are part of the wider oppositional critique of the captured state of the corruption of the uh, rising authoritarianism that is occurring in the last uh, 8 years but in the 10 years ago, when I started researching environmental movement, as I mentioned, this wasn't the case. Uh, um, green critique wasn't part of the uh, anti-regime protests, not in the end of socialism, as it was the case in many, in many uh, post-socialist, now then socialist countries, nor the critique was uh, more, mostly nationalistic in tone. And on the other hand, it wasn't part of the critique of uh, Slobodan Milosevic and his regime in, two in year 2000. So th then it was more about democracy and Europe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the environment became a topic only in 2010s with the uh, with the with the influx of uh, uh, international donations and uh, uh, influence of foreign donors. So most of the time like last i would say 10 years environmental movement was built uh, um, from top to bottom uh, meaning that it was uh, for supported by for, uh, foreign donations donor driven mostly in the form of professional organizations and local grassroots initiatives were underdeveloped they there were there were some protests, but usually they were not supported by NGOs, environmental NGOs and other professional organizations. So we had this huge split between local, small local initiatives on the one side and on the other side, uh, developing the environmental sector, which was not even transactional as it was the case in Czech Republic and in some other parts of post-socialist Europe, but it was something that we call the third environmental sector, meaning that those environmental organizations were not even interested in uh, participating in the, in the decision-making process. They were mostly uh, oriented towards service provision. Uh, uh, if we take the Europeanization context in, uh, in focus, we, I should mention and that, that definitely the most important influence is this introduction of this professional and support of professional NGOs, environmental organizations, that's starting to build up the green or the environmental civil society in Serbia. But for a long period, the local uh, grassroots initiatives were just not, uh, were not supported by the donors nor by the, the donor-driven environmental organizations. However, this this is uh, slight is changing in the last years. Uh, one one signal that this is changing is a number of environmental protests which are organized by citizens, which are not which are supported by environmental organizations, but not organized necessarily by them. So they are bottom up. In, those are bottom up initiatives. Other, uh, other sign of development of genuine environmental activism in the country is development of ecological citizenship and more everyday uh, environmental practices among citizens, at least among the this new, new middle classes. Uh, so we have both the local in, uh, environmental uh, um, actions of uh, people who are in, in for uh, to a certain kind uh, endangered by environmental problems and on the other side uh, middle class so we have both green and and brown environmental activism which are developing and uh, uh, this is within the um, mostly uh, related to the oppositional critique of the regime what is still largely missing is the um, the develop the support of uh, international um, international players, meaning that we don't have, for instance, uh, uh, representatives of uh, huge environmental organizations in Serbia, for instance, Greenpeace and similar organizations that would be significant support for local, for the local initiatives and local organizations. And the Brussels Arena has been opening for uh, Serbian organizations only recently. 
and uh, we are still waiting the chapter 27 of the negotiation uh, agreement to be opened. This is the chapter on environment and we will hope that this will happen in the next few years and that this will put the environmental questions on the agenda of decision makers because this question is still not really on the agenda because uh, questions of uh, economic development and uh, and some other issues are still considered more important both by the representatives of the government and by the citizens so many pool, polls and the research on the citizens and environmental attitude in serbia show that they are generally interested in environmental issues but put uh, when they put these questions uh, in context of uh, economic development and economic crisis then environmental issues are not really important anymore from them or at least they're not a top priority so i would like to wrap up with um, just saying that uh, the, the the good thing is that the situation is changing in serbia and i would say in the region so it is not anymore that we can say it's a passive civil society without genuine grassroots initiatives we see developments in different areas there is also the developments regarding the urban movements um, and uh, some other other movements as well. But the downside is that this the, the support is still largely missing. Although um, organizations are developing their capacities to interact with, with international organizations, and they are also seeing now Brussels as the place where they can put their complaints, which was not the case before. So that's on one side. And on the other side, the, the, the rising importance of um, environmental issues among certain classes, I would say, or certain parts of the pop general population, which gives the opportunity for environmental uh, issues to, to develop. But uh, still, uh, environmental uh, themes are not something that uh, politi political parties, for instance, take seriously because you still can't win seats in the parliament by talking about environmental problems. And I think that we will have to wait at least to, to one generation to change to, to have these um, environmental issues taken more seriously or to have more serious environmental problems as well. And I would just mention, and maybe that would be the the, the for the next presentation regarding the, uh, the um, uh, Fridays for Future initiative, we had one, but it was really modest. It was like maybe a few, few Fridays we gathered like, I don't know, a few te tens or a few, le definitely less than 100 people gathered and uh, had some kind of uh, protest, but it was really modest. So this kind of initiative is, wasn't really successful in Serbia at least. So I hope that I did not use more than 15 minutes. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Everyone so far has been very disciplined. I thank you all for uh, sticking through the time and thank you for, for your overview of um, environmental activism in Serbia and its development. So um, now, um, Aaron Buzogani, professor at Boku University, will give us an overview instead of uh, transnational norms and domestic activism. EU environmental policy, environmental process in Romania, Bulgaria and Hungary. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you actually, actually also to Elisaveta and, uh, for, for this uh, um, presentation because I, I can really uh, very directly build on, on, upon it. Uh, but I will try to, to do some basically a, a middle way between what um, Elisabetta has, uh, has been doing and, and, and what Pierre and, uh, and Sabrina was, uh, was, was doing, because um, I will try to place uh, my presentation a bit more in general terms, and uh, I, I will come to, to some, um, some of the empirics, uh, uh, which I also choose not, not to present one, uh, one research, but, uh, but just give a, a, a broader um, overview of uh, what, uh, what we, what we um, what, what what we were doing. I'm trying to share now my screen, but it seems to yeah. here. Okay. Okay. So um, because uh, this is um something we uh, 
it's also the first first meeting and we don't really know about each other and uh, so this is maybe just a a, um, a, a capture to, to to show where where I work or where we work with my colleague Patrick so this is the University of Natural Resources in in uh, in in Vienna um, and um, so we are because of the this is an institute which works on environmental issues so we we are focusing mostly on on on, on this uh, um, this issue and um, Patrick Schahafa, my colleague who was here in the morning, and me, we are we're, we're looking basically if we, if we want so a different aspects of political participation and environmental and energy and climate policies. So this this starts. This is basically my end from public policy, EUs and NGOs. So this is about, about compliance with EU environmental legislation, uh, also about lobbying and interest groups, green parties and green movement relations. Um, and then here it starts where it's, it gets more towards uh, uh, Patrick's uh, field, where it's about participation and local energy conflicts. So it's really looking at at uh, at all all these these really local conflicts which are uh, related to energy transitions. And and what we do together is also research on Fridays for Future and civil disobedience issues, anti-coal protests, um, and what is some more new, is a newer thing that I'm started to to, to uh, work more on it uh, recently is, is about environment, but retrograde but, uh, um, um, uh, movements. So like, like the new right, um, we usually talk about uh, environmental policy as, a, uh, as used by progressive um, um, environmental organizations, but there is a very, very interesting in my, my view um, aspect, which is related to the new right and how they frame the basically the nation nature nexus, um, we call it. Um, so this is just a broader overview of what we are doing, and now I'm coming to to some theoretical starters, which are not really uh, um, they, they, they won't be that surprising to to, to most of us. But I'm, uh, I'm I'm trying to develop them in, in, in just to give a um, maybe a a, a, bow, a, a common um, spinal cord, so to say, to, to the project, um, and uh, and um, and. I'd, I'm doing so by thinking also now what we have heard from from Pierre and and, and Sabrina, which were were really going much much further. I'm, I'm just what I'm presenting here is a very very raw and a very basic concept of what of how, how we can think of Europeanization and how we can how we can think of the Europeanization of of social movements. And and obviously this is um, not at all surprising to to uh, those of us who who worked in this tradition. Um, we can think of this as a um, as um, as Europeanization having an impact on political on political processes, as PR has called political opportunity structures, um, on on resources and on, on on frames. So this could mean that you're pretty much like uh, along the, the 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 lines how Elisabetta has presented it um, in Serbia. Uh, the EU accession can open up new opportunities for for environmental policy. It makes it simply more um, uh, more important. It it might be a leverage for um, for em environmental movements, also for parties who are supporting these issues. Uh, it, but it can be also um, an, a question of uh, which is related to to resource mobilization. It simply can mean that new resources are coming in um, because of uh, EU networks, EU uh, uh, EU monies. Um, but this this can this can mean also uh, uh, network ties, which uh, which would connect local or domestic uh, in environmental organizations to the EU level. And the third uh, aspect is certainly, and this is obviously relates to to the, the triptychon of uh, of uh, what social movements researchers are doing. It relates to to the frames and the frame the frames uh, the discourses how. Um, um, which social movements use um, in, 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 in framing their uh, their goals. And this can involve European uh, aspects of uh, related to Europe um, strategically or, or um, and, and this is this is something which can can be used in um, um, uh, in the domestic field. And, it, and obviously it's very, very this is impact of how Europeanization uh, is impacting on, on different members. It is very different. We take it from Serbia and go go further to countries in this in Central and Eastern Europe, to towards Western and Southern Europe. Obviously, the the context uh, also matters whether a country is in a, an accession uh, process um, or 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 it's it's an, a long time member or um, or something which I'm I have worked quite 
intensively uh, on several years ago is it, it, it might not even be uh, necessarily an EU member state or, or, or candidate state. Uh, your organization actually works along these lines um, also uh, further further um, um, beyond the EU's borders. So in the Ukraine or Georgia or to the same um, facts or, or the same mechanisms can be as well. So um, this is all something which, uh, which I, uh, maybe uh, it's a redundant to, to add, uh, but it's about again about the theoretical starters. Sabrina has uh, has mentioned most of them, so I think it's it's important to see the EU as a multi-level playing field, um, and and obviously there are this this at least these three perspectives which we we can use or we are using uh, uh, for our part in, in in our research. So this is uh, obviously one on, on one. Uh, on the Europeanization also more closely, so where where we where obviously uh, big literature uh, has started that the differential impacts uh, uh, are uh, are there on social movement actors. Um, also, Taros and uh, Petrova's work on transactional and participatory acti activism, showing basically that that yes, there are different types of organizations which are very differently impacted by 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 Europe. Some are. Uh, more in the international area, they are transaction, transactional. Uh, others, they even if there are these opportunity structures opening up because of Europe, they are not really interested in taking them because they are more more sticking to the, uh, the local level. Um, and uh, this is probably the case for uh, um, uh, for for he for for organizations in uh, who are protecting trees in in cities who are not really. Uh, um, Looking at at the EU, they they have local issues, and of course this can can get an, a, a, a transnational and EU framing, but it must not. Um, obviously, uh, and this is also something which was mentioned uh, um, already. Like there there is an international relations component, uh, so the boomerang effects of the transactional um, uh, activism can be used um, in uh, on the domestic level. Um, but of course, uh, we, we should also look at what norms are really transported, and, and and all this literature was very much focused on when when these boomerang effects are are working. Um, in my work, it, it pretty often happens that these boomerang effects they're just simply not working, um, and, um, and 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 this is also equally interesting. So why something which uh, we would um, assume that, that that happens in some countries is not really. Uh, other uh, somewhere else, um, and the third um, as a third research area, let's say, is is basically about uh, what we can call we can call it in different names, can give it different names, but uh, I call it here third sector research. So basically, uh, looking at state society uh, relations, state organized civil society relations, and um, and here we 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 can we have seen obviously that this EU effect has. Um, Ha, ha, is changing relations between states and states and society, societies, um, and um, uh, I, I'm referring here to also to the literature on, on basically on, on what Yadis has uh, has been telling us about also the professionalization of uh, movement organizations, and at the same time also which basically they both into it with, with, with the professionalization as, 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 uh, very often is the, the dependency on donors. Um, and, and this is these are questions which are might be more relevant uh, in, in, in Eastern Europe than, than in other um, the parts of Europe. But um, I think this 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 is also uh, something which um, relates to, um, to, to this fuller picture. So. Um, Very briefly, just one uh, like one one page where, uh, where, or one slide where I'm, I'm trying to summarize um, what um, uh, some some of the ideas we we, um, we are gathering from from research on on uh, EU uh, act, uh, environmental policy and EU uh, related activism in Eastern Europe. Um, pretty. Pretty early, in my when I started my my PhD, I had a presentation where I think uh, Donatella was listening to as well, uh, uh, and um, it was called "Stairway to Heaven" and or "Highway to Hell," and and, and basically it's it's still the same uh, topic related to why what what, what does the um, what is the impact of e of, of the EU on, um, on 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 civil society organizations? Is it, is this good or is this uh, 
um, or does it have also detrimental effects? Um, and obviously, um, there, Europeanization has in, in the field of environment quality, uh, policy uh, uh, many positive effects. It opened up uh, um, opportunity structures. But what what I think re uh, received less uh, attention was that obviously EU norms are um, also very ambivalent. Um, maybe not ambivalent in themselves, but they are. Uh, they, they they they. It's not only we're not only talking about EU. Um, you know, EU nature protection laws, but uh, the EU comes with other uh, many other issues as well. Um, so many of them related to market making. And what to do how, when these norms are conflicting on on on, on the domestic uh, level? So what to do, for example, in Poland when uh, when there is a a, a nature protection um, um, uh, legislation uh, again going against kinds of Sorry. Um, no, somebody here. really wants to call me, but uh, I, I, I won't uh, won't get there. Um, so the what happens if the EU is funding a, a highway and it's uh, uh, but it's also funding um, nature protection in the and, and this highway goes through a nature a, a nature protection area. And we have many of these issues, like conflicts between between dif different uh, EU uh, issues, and and obviously we be, need to, to look what, uh, what what happens empirically in in, 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 in these cases. Um, related to, to the resources, um, obviously there there is something like a Matthew effect and and uh, uh, on civil society uh, organizations, meaning simply that uh, some organizations are getting richer because of the EU uh, EU's effect and, and other which means that others are comparatively getting um, uh, less powerful and obviously a frame frame and frames frame bridgings are are very important also in this uh, policy field we are, we are looking at environmental issues are very often overlapping with social questions so think think of public utilities which are by the way liberalized also because of EU um, EU pressure uh, they have um, much to do about basically about growth imaginaries, about capitalism, how capitalism should work, and also very, very importantly, also about how how democracy and good governance uh, um, should work. So uh, basically, if we talk about environmental protection, that very easily we might might end up in talking about corruption uh, and uh, um, all kinds of illegal uh, issues, which um, some. Um, um, some of the elites or um, um, parties of power are, are using. So, so basically, um, what I'm trying to say here that, that at, at least if we have a look at Eastern Europe, um, looking at, East, uh, at environmental conflicts uh, are, are very, very often opening up um, baskets full of, of other conflicts. We need to What we um, in in different projects or three actually is a changing phase of activism in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and in one project, which is on, in Hungary, uh, we we find very interestingly that there uh, that there is basically less less of the transactional activism which we, which we would have expected and many many have pro uh, predicted. And um, probably this has much to do with with also the the illiberal regime Viktor Orban has. Um, um, uh, has brought about in Hungary, but um, basically what we see that if, even in cases where where transnational activism would be a, uh, an opportunity to use by by activists, they they refrain from doing so. So they, they, we call this something like a new localism. Obviously, these are urban protests, but but they are very like activists. They 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 very openly refrain from 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 um, bringing in. Transact transactional forces uh, like Greenpeace and so on, because they are again they are fed from uh, from um, from the the, co the the causes this might have, and this is of course um, reminds of us of of of, uh, of the political context where this is uh, uh, is happening. Uh, illiberal regimes are making civil society uh, activism very difficult um, and this this might lead to towards a new localism uh, and also a depoliticization uh, of protests um, which contrasts very much 
uh, towards what has been there for um, for uh, for the last uh, um, two or three decades. Um, and then we have also new kinds of uh, of, of activism, um, new middle classes uh, raising, who, who not necessarily particularly interested in, in environmental issues, but but seeing this linked um, uh, to to uh, corruption, bad governance. Illegal lobbying, uh, logging is, is uh, such an issue in, in, in Bulgaria and Romania, um, and, and I think these these are uh, these are questions which which um, which are interesting also by ways of comparison. So we we, we see very very large differences uh, in, uh, in 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 the um, in different Eastern European countries, Romania and Bulgaria, having sort of large public protests, uh, also very often in, involving environmental issues, while in other countries, this, this Hungary, for example, this, this does not seem uh, to be the case. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing with, uh, with four points, which are basically related to our project and where we could go forward. Um, one thing which I, I'm, I'm, maybe it, was, uh, it became clear also from what I just said, um, Activism is sometimes successful, sometimes not, and this this might uh, re be related also to, uh, to uh, the political context. Um, I, I would be interested in in uh, basically this effectiveness uh, part of, uh, of of activism as well in 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 the context of the of, of our project. Um, and the other thing is which which we we basically if you if you talk with uh, with, with activists. In Central and Eastern Europe, mostly, but but also beyond. Um, obviously, they 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 think that EU focus is is too strong. And what would be if um, if this would so we just should look uh, at these organizations in their own value. And if the EU plays a role, it's interesting or not. It it it, it it's interesting, but it's uh, we we shouldn't too much focus. Um, on uh, solely on the EU. I mean, obviously, this this being an EU-funded project, this is a, a um, uh, <laughs> some, something difficult to do. But but I think in terms of methodological aspects, we, we we should also take these organizations at face value. And then, of course, we can look at um, uh, what 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 uh, what what these transnational aspects are. But uh, do not start from looking to, at at this transnational. Aspect. Um, another discussion which we which is interesting for us is the shrinking space for civil society organizations, uh, which is uh, which has been discussed in most of the countries of the Western Balkans and in Central and Eastern Europe, sometimes also in Western Europe increasingly. Um, and um, this this brings again the question of regimes, the regime times uh, in, into uh, into question. Um, and this. Um, yeah, I think that this could be also interesting because we have a large selection of, of different groups. And I close with the last point being uh, what Yelizaveta has also said. Um, do we witness really a change, at least in Eastern Europe, from top down to bottom up activism? Um, and um, we might see this uh, top down activism from, you know, largely triggered by transnational actors. Um, changing towards something which is not so fancy, maybe not so really seeable uh, uh, from 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 the outside, but there is something uh, some some something more bottom bottom up. And the question is whether these grassroots will really work and and whether they are really more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I'm straight away give the floor to Graham Finlay, professor at the School of Politics and International Relations, led together with Roland Erne work at the um, University College Dublin um, for the concluding um, speech. Thank you. Um, I don't see, Ro Roland was actually going to present material on uh, European citizens initiatives and as used by trade unions, and there he is. I didn't see him, so um, I'll, I'll give the floor to Roland. <laughs> okay, so I will start by uh, selecting my presentation and uh, sharing it. Okay. So, can you see it? Can you see me? Yes, we do. Yes. Okay. Very good. So what I did, what I thought I will start with a preface, as you see there, 
uh, no no text on it, just some pictures uh, to situate um, our contribution a bit in uh, the my contribution in particular um, where I'm coming from, so that we know each other, and present uh, uh, to present each other. And what what I want to say is. Um, I'm originally coming from a social movement myself as an activist. So the, the book, the green book there is called Transnational Democracy or the Transnational Democracy. And in the 90s, I was part of a social movement that wanted to create opportunity structure in EU politics, um, direct democratic participation rights, which actually was quite of successful because it led to the creation of the European citizens initiatives in the European treaties. Then I, I, I'm still interested in transnational democracy, but then more interested in, you know, not in Habermas and political theory and uh, politics as such, but also in social movements, trade union movements. What do they do to create a transnational collective action? Because democracy only exists if there, there is transnational conflict, in my view. Uh, if there is transnational collective action. That's why I started to become a trade union specialist, uh, st starting to look at trade union action and and so whether labor with actions in companies at the European level at um, in, in other fields create a feeling of commonality uh, through action in in the field of labor politics. And then last but not least, I'm from UCD. And as I mentioned this morning, normally I'm not studying uh, Europe, but everything what I'm saying, uh, not studying Ireland in particular, but everything that, that we are saying uh, is, of course, influenced by our Irish experience, especially our experience with the crisis, uh, which uh, led to our ERC project on labor politics and the European Union's new economic governance regime, which is, I think, important for us here because we are arguing that the European economic governance regime is changing or has been changing in the last 10 years. Whereas Europe has been um, governed a long time uh, by horizontal market integration. And uh, that was difficult because uh, for many trade unions, they were facing the pressures coming from horizontal market integration, but they didn't. You can't politicize uh, horizontal market integration that easily. When the crisis hit Europe, politicians changed the integration strategy. For a long time, they really thought that by creating a market and by creating a monetary union alone, that would automatically create kind of a convergence, a kind of integration dynamics. But as we have known, um, that wasn't the case, but the crisis revealed major imbalances in the European economy, and that was threatening to, to um, break up the European Union. And as a result, what did European leaders do in order to keep the shop together, in, in order to keep Europe together? They introduced a much more vertical economic governance regime by adopting a new framework for the governance of the European Union, where the European Union now is entitled to give binding prescriptions on a country by country basis still, but still binding prescriptions in fields like social policy, um, healthcare policy, labor policy, and many areas that were hetero shielded from European economic governance interventions. And that, I think, created this politicization of the European integration process in the last kind of austerity decade. But that politicization can take two forms. It can actually lead to national resistance or disunion. Uh, you see the falling star on the left picture. That's the UK that falls off the picture. Um, but it can also create opportunities for transnational collective action. So. When, when already in the in the European Union's book in the 2000s, we saw when did the Union start to engage actually on a transnational level. They did that in the merger cases of, of multinational companies that we studied because merger policy and the corporate restructuring happened at the European level. And if people want to have an influence, 
then they had to address that at that level. So that's another possibility. So today, uh, we have a starting, as a, they take as a starting point, I think the new economic governance regime of the EU, which is a challenge for egalitarian democracy and labor movements. But then the question is, what are the levers? What possibilities are there for social movements, labor movements to change the direction of the new economic governance regime of the EU? And, and of course, we can't answer that question now in this little presentation. But what we want to do is just take one example, one little case study from our research that I think is quite interesting. So this is done with colleagues Imre Chabe and Dara Golden that are part of our big team on that uh, question. And now I'm coming to the actual presentation of this uh, talk for today. So the question is, OK, we have these opportunity structures, we have this European Citizens Initiative. Uh, but why was one of them, namely the right to water European Citizens Initiative successful? And why did the other one, fair transport, fail? Uh, that's the question that we like to address. And, and that is an interesting point, because as we see here, both of these initiatives have been launched by European federations of trade unions. So the successful right to water one was launched by the European Federation of Public Sector Unions that organize also water workers. And the fair transport one was organized by the European Transport Workers Federation. So you need uh, one million signature to call on the commission to take a, a legal, uh, no, a legislative action to table a proposal. And whereas the EPSU one, the right to vote one, gathered almost 2 million signatures, the latter only gathered 200,000 signatures, which is far away from the 1 million necessary. So what, how can we explain the difference between the two? And we do that by questioning some, some arguments that, um, that are there in, in um, in the industrial relations literature in particular, uh, because Brooks, for instance, in another Cornell book, she argues that, you know, transnational campaigns succeed when they are first and foremost about the immediate concerns, immediate outcomes for workers. But if you look at them, at the two initiatives, you see that the right to water one, the successful one, uh, aimed to ensure that water remains a public good. And the second one, fair transport, um, aim to ensure better working conditions and fair pay for workers in the European transport sector. So you would think that the, the second one would be more closely related to outcome to workers. So we would like to go through these three possible explanations um, in, uh, that are coming from the social movement research areas, but also industrial relations areas. So first, we want to discuss actor-centered factors that cannot explain the different outcome, actor-centered factors that can explain the different outcome, and then also, and that's our maybe our, the contribution that is based very much on, on our discussion of the European integration process, what are the structural factors that can explain our puzzle? So why did the ECI of the European Public Sector Union succeed, and why did the other one, why the European transport workers fail? So starting with the resources of actors, and here we see, we actually see that they cannot explain the difference. Um, if you look at staff, more or less both secretariats are, have the same amount of power. Um, both EPSO is bigger, but then they have also much more, many more workers from many more different sectors, the entire public service from healthcare to the fire, fire brigades, etc. Whereas the ETF is smaller a bit, but then also more concentrated in the transport sector. So we don't see a big difference that would explain the, uh, the puzzle, because uh, the these intra and interunion coordination problems uh, seem to be very similar in both cases. So that is interesting because uh, Brooks and others have explained success or failure of transnational campaigns very much by intra and interunion coordination problems. But in this case, that cannot be the reason. 
Another, another um, factor that is normally used, actor-centered factors, is experience. So prior experience with ECIs, no, both had no prior experience. EPSO is actually the first ECI in the first place, so they were the first one that succeeded in getting, um, getting um, the power, uh, getting them together. Then structural power of actors that relates to their position in the production process. You know, if water workers tap off, uh, go on strike, or if, if transport workers go on strike, they have a big impact. They have high structural power because they have uh, an important location in the production process. Then we could look at um, at union density. There is a difference, but the difference should play in favor of the ETF because there are more, many more, uh, many more people are members of unions in the transport sector than compared to the water sector. And then if you look at the finance, so we got the actual money that they put in to, in this campaign, the ETF had actually much more money than the, the, the EPSO people for this campaign. So that cannot explain the difference either. Now, um, we go further and say, OK, uh, what action repertoires did they use before? And then we see that um, in terms of political protests, presence in EU networks, presence in EU lobbying, presence in European social dialogue uh, structures, both are more or less the same. Um, the ETF is actually more activist in the sense that they were the only ones also in these two cases that organized also transnational strikes. So the, the, the first transnational strike of, of workers in the European context apparently uh, uh, goes back to 92, the railway workers were on strike also already 40 years ago. So that cannot explain why the ETF is less successful either. Now, what are big difference? And that comes to no surprise to our social movement people. So when you are very strong, but you have unite with other people, then you you can, small, not so strong people can get stronger. And that happened in the EPSU case. So the EPSU people made an alliance with the water movement that existed also in Italy and many other countries. And that social union, a social movement union campaign strengthened the EPSU case. And and then there were some instruments, not with the ECI as such, but with direct democratic instruments. So in Italy, we had the uh, Aqua Publica referendum. In, in Berlin, we had also a referendum on um, um, against the privatization or the recommunalization of water services. So And uh, Verdi, uh, the German affiliate of EPSO, had uh, referendums on keeping hospitals public. So there was some experience there. Although we can argue the president of the railway section of the ETF is a Swiss uh, trade unionist and he he had some experience with transnational uh, with direct democracy there as well. But overall, maybe that still is a big difference or there is a difference. Another big difference that I can explain, I think, how possible is the framing of the ECI. Also, no surprise to social movement scholars. Is it OK, Luisa? OK. <laughs> um, uh, whereas um, the transport workers framed everything in, in, in terms of workers' rights, um, the water campaign was focused, of course, also workers want to work in public service rather than a private, privatized water company, but it was framed as a broader campaign for the human right to water and against privatization in favor of public service. Whereas in, in the transport, even it involved also transport, public transport companies and transport workers, that was not framed in, in the way that that was done. And then, and that's uh, an important difference as well, the targets of the campaign. So the, the voter campaign really targeted directly the European Commission, because Commissioner Bolkenstein wanted to come, uh, privatize or open up water services for competition for a long time. He didn't succeed in the Bolkenstein directive, but then his successors pushed on and continued on in commodifying water services. 
and and then they were of course supported by water transnational corporations like uh, uh, Velia and others that were also very visible. So you can the big comp the big water companies, the big French multinationals, most of them. Whereas um, the campaign of the work on 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 the, the transport workers was against social dumping, most of it uh, involving small companies. But then also creating tensions because um, you know um, between Eastern and Western workers to some extent. Um, so these actors sent a difference can explain, but and that's maybe our contribution. What are the structural factors behind them? And we think we have to look really. We have to look at different modes of European integration again. And because these different modes present different challenges, but also opportunities. So horizontal market pressures like the ones invoked by social dumping and the transport workers campaign are not very visible. So what is fair competition? So, so you can't target um, market pressures that easily as you can target um, an EU law or a, a looming EU law that uh, pretends to commodify or aims to commodify water services. So that explains that uh, transnational action in our field, uh, we have to take them into context, not just the opportunity structure in terms of what access do we have. You now the ECI arguably gives the same opportunity structures to everybody, but also we have to set it in context against what or in which context this this structure is all right so now it's time is it okay that's 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 it so um uh, that's the 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 difference and and our conclusion is here oh, thanks a lot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm sorry we do have 10 more minutes to go and um, already I saw a few hands raising um, for people willing to intervene um, and I want to say one word to refer to the partner that was not uh, present in our discussion today but is part of our um, consortium that is um, the good lobby um, that um, is campaigning at the moment for um, effectively granting voting rights to the 17 million EU citizens that do not uh, exercise the, properly this right um, in the European Union level. Um, what I'm trying to say uh, to, to uh, before leaving the floor to the other um, want to make um, those questions is that um, while we disc um, most many actors uh, highlight how representative democracy is in crisis, some actors instead, such as the good lobby, <clears throat> still uh, um, are working and campaigning for um, representative democracy at EU level, as much as. Um, uh, it is being said repeatedly how multilateralism is in a profound crisis and at the same time many actors in the European space um, refer to the European law to advance their causes and this is the case for many social movements uh, in protection of, of uh, uh, the rights of asylum seekers to give an example that we probably will discuss during our Trapoco work. Um, and at the same time, as if um, on the one hand, the EU is a target, the EU is um, um, a political space um, and the European space is also a cultural space of references, as Pierre um, uh, underlined in, in his first speech, uh, uh, while at the same time, we do have um, um, among the most uh, well-organized um, movement, apparently, um, is the, the sovereignist movement in the last few years that um, appear to be well organized while arguing against um, the European space for sovereign uh, states in the European Union. So we th I think we have plenty of topics um, uh, to organize in a coherent framework and in the next three years we, uh, we'll be able to do it. Um, as we will discuss about social movement as much as um, uh, non-governmental or CSOs organizations. 
the first hand I see raising is Elena Flam. Um, so I wish to leave the floor to her as a first um, person asking to um, speak. Uh, you should unmute your microphone, Helena. Can you do it? You cannot. Um, it cannot. It cannot be me doing. For the sake. Yes, you did. You managed. We hear your voice, Helena. No, no. <laughs> you did it by mistake, so you didn't want to intervene. Okay, never mind. Um, anyone else then instead is willing to um, make a comment or um, introduce more elements in our discussion? I abruptly inter um, <laughs> interrupted I poor it Roland. Uh, no, I think it is, uh, uh, the time is almost over, so probably people are more shy to intervene, but we can say that we will welcome any intervention also by email or any other means, right? If there is no, of course, I didn't want to stop them, but just uh, I saw that uh, uh, people probably have to move somewhere else as we had planned to stay here only until four. So I just add that uh, we will have, we'll set up a web um, section of our website, Osservatorio Balkanic Caucas or Trans Europa, where um materials will be uploaded if you have uh, highlights to share with us of events uh, papers uh, conferences or uh, things that you want to share with us that will be the first step to uh, start building um, a wider network across uh, um, the various fields uh, related to trapoco issues maybe donatella you want to say the last few words very few, uh, for the reasons I mentioned. Uh, I want to thank you uh, very, very much, the partners uh, that have presented uh, 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 very effective idea, ideas, very stimulating ideas, uh, but also uh, Sabrina and Pierre that uh, have contributed much and that will be uh, our points of reference uh, uh, also in the future for other activities and uh, their ideas will for sure be incorporated also in our future plans and we hope to be able to network uh, also with them. Uh, I noted especially three areas that have been addressed by the different contributions. One is uh, what does it mean? Uh, what does it mean? Europeanizations. Uh, what is European about movements and uh, where to look for Europeanization? So I think that's uh, an important uh, take from today is also to go beyond our visions of uh, more traditional looking at organization action and framing uh, and also consider the building of alternative norms, uh, uh, the alternative uh, subjectivization and the constructions of uh, uh, different um, ideas of uh, uh, Europe. Uh, I second um, areas to which many of you have uh, contributed is uh, what are the processes towards uh, Europeanizations. And here we build on the previous knowledge uh, talking about externalizations, domestication, Europeanizations from below, processes of uh, solidarizations, but also I think one of uh, the main input was to go beyond this by looking also at the construction of uh, uh, alternative identities, uh, going also to a certain extent beyond uh, Europe when we think about uh, uh, transnationalization processes, but also considering that uh, processes of Europeanizations by social movements are affected by a changing context. And I think this is also an area to which uh, uh, several uh, uh, contributions have 
referred to, defining this context as a context of crisis, but also of uh, changing uh, governance uh, at the EU level uh, through uh, different, um, uh, especially uh, modes of Europeanization, institutional Europeanization in the market uh, governance and in the uh, development of capitalist structures that have been mentioned and addressed and that uh, are relevant not only when looking at uh, uh, the type of uh, collective actions by labor, uh, but also on uh, environmental issues, uh, gender issues, uh, uh, and, mig uh, and issues of migration. So I think that uh, changing um, opportunities is a relevant topic, but also that we have to go beyond the traditional vision of political uh, opportunities, uh, 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 paying more attention than we did before as scholars of social movements to the capitalist constraints and the way in which neoliberalism act uh, not only in the economic spheres but by um, uh, addressing the relationship between uh, uh, institutional governance and uh, uh, the um, economic and market integrations. There have been references to shrinking possibilities and I think that when we uh, look at um, especially uh, civil society organizations that work uh, on uh, migration, but also on the, on the environment, we see a lot of uh, criminalizations of uh, uh, NGOs and civil society organizations and social movement organizations that we have also to look at in the frame of definitions of illiberal capitalism. Uh, that uh, are uh, more and more central also when we look at some countries in Europe, uh, but also at the ways in which the European Union institutions deal uh, with some types of uh, uh, problems. So uh, we see complex dynamics uh, of, for, for instance, politizations and depolitizations that have been referred to. Uh, in different interventions, we see complex dynamic of growing criticism uh, of European uh, uh, institutions, but also growing attention to it. And uh, we see a central element, I think, for all the three pillars of our research, uh, which is the combination of uh, 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 attention to research, uh, uh, teaching, but also to the social changes. So it's relevant also when we want to move uh, to uh, some of the uh, central questions about how effective civil societies may be. Uh, and so uh, how different strategies have been uh, mixed uh, and which, with which type of uh, effects for different campaigns that are always multi-level and so always uh, have to build upon uh, different levels of threats and opportunities. So I think that uh, all of this we will uh, try probably to summarize in much more uh, details and with more time with the help uh, of all the internal members uh, uh, of the consortium, but also the help of the external uh, um, members that were uh, uh, so uh, useful for our discussion today. So once again, thank you to um, Sabrina, thank you to Pierre, but thank you also to all uh, the uh, others, uh, to uh, uh, scholars that have intervened and ce n'est qu'un début. It is just the starting. Uh, uh, this is just the kickoff. Uh, and uh, so I'm looking forward to work on these issues in the next three years. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for everyone who stayed with us till the end. See you very soon. <laughs> Ciao.